Today we begin a <clears throat> series of messages that you gave me a few weeks ago when we asked you if you had any questions about the Bible or anything out there in the world that the Bible might speak to. Well, it was started off a little slow, but I ended up getting around 20 questions. And uh, so when we asked this question, you got questions, you had some, and there, there's a lot of really good ones in there. So I'm going to do my best to get through as many as I can, and some of them I'm able to group together, and such is the case for today. There were several questions that had to do with the Holy Spirit, His personhood, His work. So we're going to talk about those things today. So if you have your Bibles together with you, uh, even if you don't, go ahead and stand with us at this point. I'm going to ask you, if your Bible's like mine, fine. If it's like on a, on a little uh, phone or something like that, like a lot of you have, that's fine too. But just ask you to hold it up. Would you repeat with me that phrase that's up there on the, on the sc- screen right now? This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught by its wisdom to the glory of God, and I will never be the same again. God bless you. Be seated. Well, today I'm going to use a blackboard or whiteboard, I guess, is what I'm so used to calling them blackboards in the old teaching days and everything. But this will help me to write things down for you to uh, be able to follow along with what I'm talking about. So today we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. And the first question that we'll deal with is this question of who is He? Who is the Holy Spirit? Now, I'm going to answer this in a couple of different ways. One of them would be, he is one of the three persons of the Trinity, okay? It's one of three persons in the Trinity. Now, for the Trinity, if you're really a novice here about the, these things, Trinity is God the Father, Jesus the Son, and then the Holy Spirit. So he is the Holy Spirit. He's one of those. Now, how do I know that he's really a person? Well, I can answer that question, and we can move on through the rest of these things if I just said, well, because the Bible tells me so. But we're going to talk a little bit about the truth of the Bible through this series, too, and and today I'll mention it in the context of the Holy Spirit. But we do learn about the personhood of the Holy Spirit when being a part of the Trinity, and that He is really a person. So many people reduce Him. There's a reductionist methodology when it comes to the Holy Spirit. Oh, I'll give you God, and I'll give you Jesus Christ. <clears throat> but the Holy Spirit, what are you really talking about? That's more of a force or it's kind of an it or something like that. And, no, I'm telling you, he, he is a person, and the Bible refers to him as such. There are personal pronouns that are used of him. In John chapter 16, verse number 7, Jesus says that I will send him, personal pronoun there, the Holy Spirit. Jesus was getting to die on the cross uh, getting ready to die on the cross. He's getting ready to go uh, into the grave, rise from the grave, and ascend to heaven. But he wanted his disciples to know without a doubt, there is someone I'm going to leave here for you, and he's going to be so special in terms of how he'll be with you, in you, relate things that are important from God to you, and I'm really excited about being able to send him to you. So he definitely refers to him not as an it, but as a him. And another thing about him is, is he acts personally for us, okay? He acts personally for us. Now, when I say acts personally... I mean the fact that there's something that about the Holy Spirit that uh, you can say, when I see things being done, actions being taken, I know the Holy Spirit's behind that. Here's how this works. He acts personally means that he convicts the world of sin. In John chapter 16, verse number 8, the um, gospel writer John said, of the Holy Spirit, and this is the same discourse that Jesus was giving to his disciples uh, that we were looking at just a second ago, or referring to a second ago. But in John 16, verse number 8, when he, there's the personal pronoun again, when he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. Some of your translations might read, he will convict the world. So he not only acts personally, but uh, another thing that he does is he convicts the world. And when I say that, I'll just simply say it's of sin. And all that's attached to that, including judgment, the Holy Spirit's involved in all of that. Then we go over to the book of uh, of, uh, Romans chapter 8. Now, we just spent a lot of time in Romans chapter 8 recently, but I want to go back to for just one more verse of Scripture because there's a reference made to the Holy Spirit that's very important. And it says that He intercedes for us. Look at Romans 8.26. In the same way... 
the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. We don't know what we ought to pray for sometimes. Sometimes, don't you ever get in a position where you're praying to God and all of a sudden you just, yeah, I just don't feel like I'm getting through. I just, I, I'm not able to say what I want to say. Just understand this, there is this person called the Holy Spirit. And he kind of backs up a little bit and he'll look at you and he'll look at the Father and says, I can tell you what he's saying. I know what's on his heart right now. And he'll intercede for us with words that are beyond our, able to, our able, ability to express. But there's something else he does for us. He has, he's involved in a calling, in a calling. And this is something that all ministers should really pay attention to, but I learned about it over in Acts chapter 13, verse number 2, where the Apostle Paul says that he was called by the Holy Spirit to go on a missionary journey. And so he responded to that calling. He let the, the, the elders there at Antioch put their hands on him and pray for him, and then they commissioned him to go because it was God's calling, not their idea. They all recognized the person of the Holy Spirit involved in that. And then another thing is in Acts chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, he enables us. Now, I know there's a negative connotation when we say somebody's an enabler, but that's not what we're talking about here. The kind of enabling he does is phenomenal. Look at, with me over in, in the book of Acts. Let's look at chapter 2. And I want to look at verses 3 and 4. What's going on here is this is the beginning of the church. This is the day the church was born. And so the apostles were all waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit in power. And he's going to enable them to do something they could not do really on their own. So in verse number 3, it says, They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them, meaning the disciples. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. How do you, on that day of Pentecost, speak with just about 12 or 13 guys? How do you speak to nationalities that are representing nearly 30 different dialects? How do you do that kind of thing? Well, it's a miraculous thing, I think, more the gift of hearing than it is in tongues that they're referring to here. But the people heard the gospel as it was being preached. For Peter, as he preached, it sounded like he was just preaching in his normal native tongue. But as the people heard what he was saying, it was amazing that the Holy Spirit was enabling that whole thing to take place. And so people were able to hear the gospel and respond to it. Another thing that he does is just to back up one verse, or one chapter, excuse me, uh, back to chapter 1, Jesus is getting ready to ascend into heaven. And there's something that he does that's very interesting. Where he, he enables like that, he also empowers. Empowers. These guys were not highly educated men. And so when Jesus is getting ready to ascend into heaven, he says, now you wait here. You wait right here in Jerusalem until the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Look at it in the wording of the, the uh, writer Luke. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. In other words, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you're going to feel this power, and that is going to be the power you'll need to go to all the different parts of the world. You'll start right here in Jerusalem, in Judea, and then you're going to just branch on out until you get to all the ends of the world. You will not be able to do this on your own is the implication. You'll do it because the Holy Spirit is empowering you. So, the Holy Spirit, he's one of the three persons in the, in the Holy Trinity. He has his own personality and expresses himself in a variety of different ways. There's a second thing that I want to tell you about him that's really important. Um, when I say he's one of the three in the Trinity, I don't want you to miss this part of it, though. One of the three that's in the Trinity, but he is still God. Still God. Now, I'm not just talking about the fact that he's like God. No, he's his own distinctive part. You have God, who's also known as the Father. You have Jesus Christ, who's called the Son. You have the Holy Spirit, who is an entity in and of himself. He is God. We learn about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. The Apostle Paul tells us there that there are certain things where we get to know only because the Spirit reveals those things to us, because he knows everything to begin with. So 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Let's look at verses 10 through 12. 
These things that you've not seen, things you've not heard, your mind hasn't even thought of, these are the things God has revealed to us by His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. Do you hear what's being said there through that whole passage there? He searches all things. Therefore, the implication is He knows all things, and He will reveal everything we need to know to accomplish God's purposes for us. We all are different people. We have different things to offer the world, but the Holy Spirit knows how to work through each of us, giving us what information we need to have from God to accomplish God's purposes. He is omniscient then. He is also omnipresent. Now, go back to the book of Psalms, and let's look at Psalm 139. Just a few verses. It's a long psalm, but I'm not going to read all of it. But Psalm 139, and it's verses 7 through 10. Listen to David's heart as he says, Where can I go from your spirit? And then everything else has to do with the the spirit in connection with him. But where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise with the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Where can I go from your spirit? The answer by those questions, that question, by all the things that he says, you can't go anywhere without God's spirit already being there. He's omnipresent. It means he's everywhere. He's also a God who is omnipotent. Omnipotent means all-powerful. So if I go back to the book of Romans once again, and we're going to look at Romans 15, verses 18 and the first part of verse number 19, listen to these words. Yet I have written you quite boldly on some points to remind you of them because of the grace of God. To be a minister of Christ to the Gentiles, he gave me priestly duty, proclaiming the gospel of God, so that the Gentiles might become an acceptable offering to God. And now here it comes. He said all that just to say this. It's all done and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. His omnipotence is that he can work anything. So powerful that... There's no person he can't reach. He's so powerful that he can move into any situation and he can operate. The gospel is working through everybody because of the sanctification of the Holy Spirit. Now, when I go back to the book of Acts, chapters 1 and 2, I can see that very clearly when the church was born. Just as the apostles received the Holy Spirit, they went out in Jerusalem and began to preach. They began to perform miracles, and they were showing all kinds of powerful wonders to people, signs to people, that we're not doing this on our own. This is an omnipotent God who can change everything, and there's no other explanation for it. It's God, and it was the Holy Spirit who was behind it. And He's also an eternal God. All i got to do now is just go back to the book of Genesis, chapter 1, just look at verse number 2. Nothing exists. Nothing exists except just the void, like the earth was formless, empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. He's just waiting, waiting for everything to start. He knew with God. He knew what was about to be created. And he's just hovering there, and he's just waiting. And it's always been that way. Before the world was created, there was the Holy Spirit always right there with God. And I can put that with Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, where the writer of Hebrews tells us, How much more then? Will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal, there it is, that word, eternal spirit, offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. The eternal spirit, who was always hovering in the beginning before the world was ever created. Now, what does the writer of Hebrews tell us? He says he's able to be there to cleanse our consciences, and he leads us, leads us to a place where we can serve the living God. He's eternal, and it'll be that way forever. So who is the Holy Spirit? Well, he's certainly one of the Trinity, one of the persons in the Trinity, and according to Scripture, he's also God. So I'll raise that part of it right there because another question that comes up then is, what does he do? 
Well, I've already alluded to a number of different things, but I want to get a little more specific in terms of what he does for us. What does he do? So I'm going to put a big what up here. And I want to begin with, with an idea here. What he does is he seals our salvation. Okay, so... Seals our salvation. Have you ever thought of the Holy Spirit that way? I wanted to include this part in here because I, I love the teaching that the Scripture does on this when it talks about sealing our salvation. You think your salvation is sealed just because, okay, I believe in Jesus Christ. I know he died for my sins. That's all that needs to happen. Well, you can pull Scriptures out that would say that, but not when you keep everything in its context. And so I look at John chapter 3 and verse number 5 where a man named Nicodemus came to ask some questions of Jesus. This was a, a teacher of the Jewish people. And he wants to know, who are you? What are you all about? Where do you come from? And Jesus kind of answers all that by saying in verse number 5, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. The symbol of regeneration, of purity, that when God comes into your life, but it's all accomplished because the Holy Spirit is there making it happen. He's part of that, that sealing deal. When we believe, it's because he's led us to that point to believe. But he's also there to help us to stay close, meaning he has sealed us. And I get a better image of that over in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1. I can remember when we were in uh, class, um, I was going to college, we, had to, we, we wanted to pick a passage of Scripture that we could, in third-year Greek, we could exegete, you know, interpret the Greek. And so we were looking at the Philippians book. Why? Because the Greek is a lot easier there. The grammar's constructed the sentences are making, you know, more sense the way they're put together. And our professor kind of had an idea that was what we'd say is something like that. So he just said, ah, he says, you guys can do Philippians anytime. He says, I'd really like for you to tackle Ephesians. We're going to look at the first four chapters of Ephesians this whole semester. So each day we're responsible for two verses of Scripture because we cover two a day. And you had to be ready every day in order to, in case he called on your name. But I got to looking at Ephesians 1, and I thought the professor had a good sense of humor. You know why? Ephesians 1, verses 1 through 14, just one sentence. That's all it is. It may look like more than that in the English, but in the Greek, it's one sentence, so you had to keep all your antecedents straight, if you know what I mean, on that grammar stuff. But one of the things I liked as I got down to the end of that section, that first section, was Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. It says, You also were included in Christ Jesus when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal so that God could say, this belongs to me. This one really does. The promised Holy Spirit is that seal, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. You were sealed by God. He looks at you and sees the Holy Spirit's mark on your life. That's one of mine. That's what it's all about, is to know that the Holy Spirit moves into our lives, identifies us, and marks our identity so that God says, okay, I see, that's one of mine. The Holy Spirit's very active. And really what he's sealing is, is this. You have been saved, and you don't know what all of salvation is about yet. You only know the good things that we experience as Christians here as we live in relationship with God and with each other. There's plenty of good to happen there, but we don't know what God is really preparing for all of us someday, what's out there in heaven, out there in eternity. But just to have an idea of how good things are going to be, God says, I'll seal you with my Holy Spirit, who is the down payment of the things yet to come. Now, a few of you in the room I know have heard me use this illustration before, but that same professor that I had in Greek class, when he came to this phrase here about the down payment, well, we, we, got, we got to looking at all the stuff that was there about how banks did things in those days and financial obligations that were made and deposits that were made and guaranteeing with the deposit that something was going to happen. And we were, we were all caught up in all that stuff like that. He said, yeah, that's all good, true. And he said, that's a true source of how the Word was developed. But I don't know how much all this stuff really preaches. He said, let me just simply put it this way. When I was a little boy, I'd come home from school and I'd come into the, into the front door at the house and I could smell right away that my mother, as she was making supper, I could smell this chocolate cake baking. And I wanted a piece of that chocolate cake. I wanted the chocolate cake right now, a nice piece of it. And I'd head right over to the cake, and my mom would say, stop right there. 
Now that cake was made for supper, and you're going to get a nice slice of it after supper's over. He said, and I was thinking to myself, I want a piece of that cake right now. She said, but I knew you'd want something right now. So looky here, I got, and she got these little cupcakes made from the same batter, same icing was used and everything. She said, this won't ruin your supper, but it's a promise that after supper, you're going to get a big slice of that cake over there. He said, guess what? The Holy Spirit is God's little cupcake to us. It's a promise that something much bigger and better is waiting for us at the end. He looked at all of us and said, gentlemen, that will preach. And he's right. It does. We connect with that kind of simplicity of what is happening in his text. But he is the seal of what is coming in his final form in all of our salvation. Something else that he does, and it's important that the Holy Spirit's involved, what he, what he does is he gives us life. He gives life. Genesis chapter 2, verse number 7. Don't miss what's being said here at all. And we do, just reading our English text, we can miss it very easily. But Genesis 2, chapter 7, when the story is referred to about the, the man beginning to live, look at how it comes about. It says, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground. We just have something made of dirt and clay. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. It wasn't until God breathed into the nostrils of man that he became a living being. But the word that is translated for breathed is the same word that is translated as spirit and even applied to the Holy Spirit throughout the Bible, all the way through. So from the beginning, God wanted his spirit to be connected to us. And he, we didn't live until his spirit was breathed into us. Job understood this very well. When I go back a little bit later in the book of, in the Old Testament, and I come to the book of Job, uh, I want you to look at chapter 33 with me in verse number four, uh, verse number four, yeah, verse number four. Job says, the Spirit of God has made me. The breath of the Almighty gives me life. Spirit of God, that's the Holy Spirit. He has made me, and it's His breath that gives me life the breath of the Almighty God. So, the Holy Spirit, what does He do? Well, He seals our salvation, but He is also the one who has given us life. He breathes life into us. A third thing that He does is He indwells the believer. Indwells the believer. That means He lives inside of us. There's no question about it, according to Scripture. Now, one of the ways I know that happens is in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, when the people said to Peter, what can we do to be saved? We know we've blown it. We killed the Christ who then rose from the dead. We know we've blown it, but we don't want to be unsaved. So what can we do to be saved from the impending doom that's there? Peter looks at him and says, well, you need to repent. You need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You'll be forgiven of your sins, is what he tells them. And then he says, and you'll be given the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, I like to think about it this way. When God takes all the sin out of your life, there's a vacuum. There's an empty void that's right there. You know what he does? He fills that void with his Holy Spirit. Because if he doesn't, Satan knows how to take advantage of that situation. He'll fill it up with stuff you don't want. So you, you realize then at the very beginning, when you believe and you've been forgiven of your sins, when you've been united with Christ, the Holy Spirit comes into your life as a gift from God. Peter said that. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to understand something else, and listen to me carefully, because it's not what everybody believes, but I think, I think it's very strong that this is what the Scripture is saying. When it says you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, it does not mean some gift like speaking in tongues. Not in this context. Matter of fact, the word that is used for gift is an entirely different word. There is another word that's used for gift, and it's called charisma. The plural of that would be charismata. And that's used in the original language anytime all the gifts are listed. But when it refers to the Holy Spirit as himself being a gift, it's a different word entirely. entirely. So he is God's first gift in your life. And once he's there, he can dispense all kinds of gifts. And we have lists of them in the Scriptures but he is a gift himself, and he comes to indwell the Holy Spirit as, as the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to look at, at 1 Corinthians, how important this is. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, first part of verse number 19. It says, Do you not know 
that your body, your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. If you're a believer of Jesus Christ, he has put his spirit inside of your body. Now, earlier in the book of 1 Corinthians, he did talk about the Holy Spirit indwells the body of Christ, meaning the church. But now he's referring to each individual. He indwells each of us individually. And that's big. That's huge. But once he's there, too, something else that he's involved in doing, he teaches and he also guides. Excuse my S right there. That's not a very good one. I write like some doctors I know in this church sometimes. All right. They'll have something to say to me, I know. He teaches and he guides. Let's go to the Gospel of John. Just before Jesus was put on the cross, just the night before he was put on the cross, John chapter 14, and it's verse number 26. Here's what it says. But the Advocate... The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. So Jesus is saying, when I leave, I'm not just going to leave you alone. I'm going to leave my Holy Spirit behind, and he's got a task. He is going to teach you everything I've taught you. He'll remind you about that, and he'll continue to teach always. Teaching. What does he teach us? Teaches us what this book has to say and how to apply it to our lives. The teaching part, you can teach somebody something, okay, they've acquired information, but what do you do with that? That's where it needs some guidance. How do you use that stuff? Well, over in John chapter 16, look at verse number 13. It says, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth, and he will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. When he comes, he not only speaks truth into us, he will guide us in all that truth. What does it mean? How do we live by it? The more that you get to know what the Spirit is teaching you through this book, the more you'll understand what God wants you to do, how he wants you to live, and you'll feel the hand of God guiding you through every situation of life. Well, who he is, he's one of the three persons, he's certainly God. What he does, this is all that he does, what you see right there. But there's something else that I want to get to very briefly here this morning. When we deal with who, that's important. When we deal with what, that's also important. But then how does he do it? Just how does he go about doing all this stuff that we've been talking about this morning? And I've already alluded to that just in what I finished saying right there because it ties in nicely. Let's just put how up here. How does the Holy Spirit do his work? Well, the first thing I would tell you this is this. The inspired word of God. God. We don't have just a collection of writings by a bunch of men. We call it the Bible. This is the inspired Word of God. Every part of this Bible is something that God wanted us to know. And so I go to show you that is 2 Timothy chapter 3, where Paul, writing to a young preacher, wants him to never forget the things that he learned from his mother and his grandmother. And he said, it's also things that I've taught you as well. And he reminds him of this fact, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All Scripture, you hear that? All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training, and righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. How does the Holy Spirit get everything he does done in your life? He leads you to understanding and applying this book very clearly. This book is useful for teaching you everything you need to know about living life that is a good life and it's acceptable to God. All we need is right here. He provides it. There's numerous reference on the Holy Spirit as being the author of this book. Just look under Holy Spirit in a concordance, and then whenever you see anything that's attached to the Scriptures or the Word, it's always talking about His, He being the source of teaching all those who wrote this book. He taught them what to say so that we may receive it as the divine teachings of Christ, the divine teachings of God, so that we may be useful to God in this life. Now, the inspired Word of God is how He does it. There's another application to how He does things, and it's called gifts. I referred to that earlier. Gifts. Once you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you'll receive at least a gift, if not more than one gift. 
And I know this, I go to 1 Corinthians, this is only one passage that we can go to here, but let's go to 1 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 12, let's take a look at verses 7 and 11. Paul says, now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Catch that first of all. Each one has been given a manifestation. That's just another way of saying they've been given an expression of God's gifts. You got one of those gifts. And he lists a number of those gifts there after uh, verse number 7 until he comes down to verse 11. And he says, all of these, meaning these gifts, are, to, are the work of one and the same Spirit. And he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Now be clear. All gifts are not given to one individual, and we don't all get the same gift. 1 Corinthians 12 makes that very plain. But it's given for the building up of the body of Christ. In the process, you're part of the body of Christ. You are built up. But God gives his gifts to you so that you may help other people. They're using their gifts to help you and everybody else. It's all given for unity's sake. And I know some folks step back and say, well, I don't know what my gift is. How do I find out what my gift is? Well, you know, you can pray about that to God. His Holy Spirit will hear those prayers, and He'll help to answer those prayers. And part of the way He answers those prayers would be in the Bible itself. Study out the subject of gifts. There are plenty of good books about that subject, but study out the the, the use of gifts as they're talked about in Scripture. Talk to other Christians about those things. You know what I found out to be the most useful thing is talking to other Christians. Because they know you. They can say, well, I know what the gifts are. You know what? I believe you have this gift or that gift. And you put that to the test. And if some good things are happening, you're blessing other people's lives, and the body of Christ is being built up because of just something you're doing, very likely you found at least a gift that the Holy Spirit has given to you. The gifts he gives, that's how he does what he does. And then the last thing I would say of how he does what he does is the fruit. The fruit that he produces in your life. Now, this is different than the gifts. You go over to Galatians chapter 5. And Paul is talking there about a contrast between the things of this world, the way that you can identify a person who's caught up in the world. is all kinds of things that are not very nice. Um, you know, he talks about idolatry and witchcraft and hatred and all kinds of other things like that. And he says, I warn you that anyone who is caught with those kind of things in their life as a pattern, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. But, here's the contrast, verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control against such things, there is no law. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, etc., etc., etc. Now, I want you to understand something. Fruit there is singular. He lists a bunch of things, love, joy, peace, kindness, all that, you know, gentleness, all that. It's all listed there. We say, well, those are individual things. But when you get the Holy Spirit, you get all of those things. Now, some of those might have to be worked on in different ways. You know, uh, some people come to the concept of being kind a lot easier. They come to the concept of having peace in their lives. But all that stuff are things that God has placed there and are going to grow in your life like a fruit grows. And that's how the Holy Spirit gets done what He wants to do with our lives individually and within the body of Christ as well as, as we reach the world. can't do it without the Holy Spirit. And so, who is He? Well, he's one of the three persons, persons in the Holy Trinity. He's God himself. What does he do? He seals our salvation. He gives us life. He indwells a believer, and he teaches and guides that believer. And how does he do it? First of all, through the inspired Word of God, and then through the gifts that he gives. We learn and we grow and we build up each other, and then the fruit that grows in our lives. He's pretty active, and he really wants to do all of this in every one of us. So here's my conclusion today. It comes down to about three different words that I think are important words for us to grasp that you talk to the Holy Spirit about. Holy Spirit wants us to come to a position where we believe. Believe what God is saying to you from His Word. Believe it. And then the second thing you do is you receive it. And receive it doesn't mean just, okay, I believe the right things about God, but now I'm receiving also His Holy Spirit, and I understand there's things He does. Well, receive it in such a way that you not only understand who the Spirit is, understand the life that He's called you to, but you let Him do those things. And that's where I would put the last word up there. Live. Live. For when you believe the right things about God, 
that Jesus is your Savior. He wants to forgive you of your sins. When you believe those right things, you know what happens next? You accept Christ into your heart. You receive everything he has for you and everything that's necessary for you to live your life for him. And then that is, that last concept is just live. Live with the, the fullness of the Holy Spirit in your life. I've told you before, I think some of you, that I had a professor that used to say in school, Dr. James Strauss used to say, all real living is meeting the resurrected Lord. And to accept his spirit into your life and let him live through you, unless you're doing that, you're just sucking air on this earth until you don't breathe anymore. All real living is meeting the resurrected Lord and living by the power of his spirit. And so today I want to encourage you a little bit more with just one final thought. And it's really a little book that you can get. I saw people this morning told me afterwards they were looking at this book on their, their phones and they were ordering that, that book too. It's a little book called The Baptism and Fullness of the Holy Spirit. One of my favorite writers ever was a man by the name of John R. W. Stott. He was an English Anglican uh, pastor. He died just a few years ago, but the books that he left in his trail are unbelievable in the change they can make in your life. But this was one of my favorites, about the shortest one he ever wrote, Baptism and Fullness of the Holy Spirit. It's what it's called, John R. W. Stott. Thoughts that I share with you today, Dr. Stott takes those things and just expands them. And the beauty of Stott is he's a brilliant man, but he communicates where everybody can understand him. So don't be afraid to buy this book. It's a great little book that I think will help you a whole lot understand the person and the work of the Holy Spirit better. Well, my prayer after this sermon is over today is that it's helped you understand the Holy Spirit a little bit more, but in, in a way that not only, hmm, I know more now, but now I can unleash that Spirit. Just let Him have His way through some of the things we, we talked about here today. Let's pray about that. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to share about the Holy Spirit. We know that he is one of the Trinity. He's a person. He's not just a force in life. He is a person. He knows you so well, and he knows each of us so well. And he can bring those two factors together in a powerful way where we can know more about what our lives are all about. We can live our lives on purpose. And we can live our lives in such a way as to be pleasing to you until that day when we are at home with you. And we realize, Father, that it's only just beginning here. What he's doing now is just introducing us to all the, the joys that are going to be ours in heaven someday. But thank you for giving us that down payment of the Holy Spirit to know more of you, more of your mind, more of your will, and to be able to live in a closer relationship with you. I pray your richest blessing on each person here today as they once again take a look at the Holy Spirit in their lives and live, really live, because of him. I pray in Christ's name. Amen.